Hello, saints, peace, love, and grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. In our last study, we saw how Festus took uh, the place of Felix as governor of Judea. Festus meets with Agrippa and introduces him to the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul has appealed to the Emperor of Rome. So, under law and as a Roman citizen, Paul has to go to Rome to be tried by the Emperor personally. In our study today, in chapter 26, we're going to see Paul giving his testimony before Agrippa. And Paul once again explains how he met our Lord Jesus on the way to Damascus and how Jesus did in fact raise back to life the resurrection. The year is right around 59 AD to 60 AD. Beginning our study, Acts 26, King James Version Bible, in verse 21. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. Now it was a, a tradition or a custom back then to raise your hand in a submissive manner toward the people of power or authority before speaking. In this case, we're seeing King Agrippa II. In verse 2, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Now, we know from our, our last study that Agrippa was very well versed in Jewish laws and traditions. In verse 4, my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning. If they would testify that after the most strictest sect, straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Now, remember, Paul was born in Roman Tarsus, Gentile territory. He eventually moved down to Jerusalem to study under Gamaliel, a doctor of the Mosaic system, Jewish law of the sect of the Pharisees. In verse 6, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Now here Paul's hinting on the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. In verse 9, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Now, you know, sometimes you meet people in this world that have done many, many, many bad things in their life. And they feel as though there's no way they'll ever be accepted into heaven because of the sins that they've committed in their life. And one good passage of scripture to share with people who feel that way is Acts 26, 9 through 11. Paul was responsible for killing believers of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus says, God's children, Paul was murdering them. Not only was he a murderer, but Paul blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. So, Paul is a very good example that anyone can get saved. doesn't matter how many sins you've committed or whatever you've done. God will forgive and wash away all of your sins. And the memory of your sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. In Psalm 103, verse 10 through 13 it reads he does not punish us for all our sins he does not deal harshly with us as we deserve for his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth he 
has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. So Paul was on his way to Damascus to have more believers killed. And Jesus came to him, saves him. Jesus' grace transform, it transforms Paul right on the spot. It was an amazing, amazing situation. In verse 12, Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now in verse 14, there's a very common question that arises. There seems to be a contradiction in Paul's story concerning his experience on the road to Damascus. Now one thing I've learned is that there are no contradictions in the King James Version Bible. There's not one. What may seem to be a contradiction has always been due to the lack of my understanding. Now, what am I talking about here? <clears throat> well, the seeming contradiction lies within comparing two verses in the book of Acts. The first verse is Acts 9, um, I'm sorry, chapter 9, verse 7. The second verse is Acts chapter 22, verse 9. Now, let's look at those. Acts 9, 7. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Now in Acts 22, 9, And they that were with me saw indeed the light, and were afraid. But they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. So one verse says that they heard a voice. The next verse says that they didn't hear a voice. A seeming contradiction indeed. Now the only way to unravel a contradiction is by looking at the uh, uh, you know the right division and also going back to the Greek. The word voice here used in Acts 9 is the Greek word phone, which means hearing, speech, or someone talking, but not necessarily understanding what's being said. The Greek makes a distinction between hearing a sound as a noise and hearing a voice as a message. Now, the people that were traveling with Paul heard the voice as a sound, just like the crowd that heard the sound of the Father as thunder when he was speaking to his son Jesus in John 12, 28. John 12, 28, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered, and others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. You see, they heard thunder, but didn't understand what our Father was saying. So in Acts 9 7, they heard a voice. In Acts 22 9, it goes, further into detail and says they heard not the voice meaning they didn't understand what was being said only Paul did and the only way to unravel this seeming contradiction is by looking at the root word in the Greek now one word in Greek can sometimes translate to several different English words again this is all part of studying to show ourselves approved we need to study God's Word continuing on in verse 15 and I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. Notice in verse 17, Paul reiterates even in further detail how his mission was to go to the Gentiles. Now, why was God sending Paul to the Gentiles? Because the Jews rejected God three times. First, 
they rejected the father then they killed the son then they blasphemed and rejected the Holy Spirit at the stoning of Stephen Israel rejects God three times God then stops everything he stops their promised earthly kingdom from being ushered in and he then turns to the Gentiles this is the period 2,000 years of grace God reveals to Paul the new system if you will and we know this new system as the mystery hidden God since before the creation of the world so what's this mystery all about the mystery is that God would build a body of believers made up of all men neither Jew nor Gentile but members of a body the body of Christ that's who we are today now continuing on we're gonna repeat verse 17 to keep the context flowing delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me now notice notice the verse says faith faith that is in me and not the law or good works verse 19 whereupon O Agrippa I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance let's look at verse 20 a little closer this is one of those verses that has a seeming contradiction as well so we need to study this through and apply right division in order to understand the context of what Paul is saying here the first part of this verse we need to look at is that they should repent and turn to God if you don't understand the definition of the word repent then this verse can cause you all kinds of problems and confusions on a side note here if you've never seen my video on repentance and you're unsure what it even means to repent then I highly suggest you take the time to watch the video the easiest way to find that video go to Google type in Lonnie Martin repent to be saved religion of man what does God say and it should come up in the search you could also Google it or YouTube either way it should work repent to be saved religion of man what does God say now obviously we need to keep our study on the book of Acts okay so without getting too deep on a study on repentance let's look at the context of what Paul is saying here and apply right division to figure this out the right way first we need to define what the word repent means the biblical definition not the world's definition the biblical definition of the word repent all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation each and every time the word repent is used it simply means to change one's mind now over time especially as we get closer to the second coming and especially especially now that people very seldom use the King James Version Bible and have turned to the newer corrupted versions the definition of the word repent is being changed and it's confusing people and how is it being changed well the word repent according to the world's definition means to confess your sins it means to constantly keep confessing your sins to keep your salvation or to prove that you believe you see the newer versions twist the word repent to mean that you need to keep performing in order to keep being saved if you don't keep performing or repenting then you'll lose salvation it's all one big lie that points straight to a works based religion or denomination so looking back at the verse in question Paul says that they should repent and turn to God now if we apply the biblical definition of repent here this verse simply means to turn from disbelief in God to belief in God it's that simple now the next half of the verse Paul says and do works meet for repentance the simple definition means proof that a person has changed his mind from disbelief to belief this doesn't mean a person needs to perform good works to get saved or to keep being saved that's not what this verse is saying at all but it's commonly twisted to fit false teaching 
If it was possible to get saved by repenting and doing good works and confessing our sins daily, then our Lord Jesus died and rose again for nothing. His work on the cross was in vain. The entire reason why Jesus came and did what he did is because not one person on this earth or even 2,000 years ago or even 5,000 years ago was capable of being righteous on his own or her own. They need the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Now, if you want more information and study on this verse, I found a study written by uh, Brother Justin Johnson, a fellow right divider. He does an excellent job explaining Acts 26.20 in detail. I'm going to put the address up on the screen and you can copy it and go there and study this out even more. Looking at the book of Ephesians as well, Paul tells us exactly how good works apply to the body of Christ today. Ephesians 2 verse 8, a very familiar and common verse, popular verse, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, notice Paul says, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. <clears throat> this means that once we're saved in Christ Jesus, then he's able to use us to perform good works as the body of Christ. Okay, that's important to understand. Now, what this verse does not say is that we need to perform good works to keep our salvation, nor does it say we need to perform good works to get saved. Okay, moving on in the study, Acts 26, 21. For these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Verse 24, And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am except these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor and Bernice, and they that sat with them, and when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he not appealed unto Caesar. So they admit that Paul is innocent. They find no fault with Paul, and they would have ruled to set Paul free. But since Paul appealed to the emperor at Rome, in this case, being Caesar, the law dictates that Paul, his appeal, has to follow through, fulfilling what Jesus told Paul, that he would stand in Rome to testify to preach the gospel of grace before all men. So in closing, we've seen Paul once again speaking forth his testimony of how he became a believer in Christ Jesus on the way to Damascus. It's also important to remember the timeline of when Paul left Damascus, he goes to Arabia, comes back to Damascus, and then he travels to Jerusalem for a short period of time. And this is when he was preaching mostly to the Jews. And if you recall, Paul left Jerusalem abruptly and he goes back to where he was born, back to Gentile territory in Tarsus. And there he stayed for over 10 years preaching the gospel of grace to the Gentiles. And that's what we studied some time ago, all the way back chapter 9, 13, and on in mid-Acts. So, that leads us to our next study, Acts chapter 27. We're almost done with the entire book of Acts, showing the transition from the kingdom gospel from Peter over to the mystery gospel with Paul from a faith plus works based 
situation over to a faith only based belief until our next study peace grace and love of christ jesus be with all of you i'll see you on the next video lord willing